Hello, and welcome to Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week 2021. My name is Nami Echelov, and I'm the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio's director, as well as the interim CEO for the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. We want to thank you for joining us for this special program, as well as to thank the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission for underwriting all the production costs associated. In case you'd like to see any of our other programs or other resources available put forth by the museum, please make sure to check out the Holocaust Memorial Museum's website at hmmsa.org. And now for our program. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Zucker, and I'm the Director of Jewish Engagement and Learning at the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. Thank you for joining us for this important week of Holocaust education. I'd like to introduce our speaker for this presentation, Mr. Roy Kamen. Mr. Kamen is going to tell you about his father, Peter, who, as part of 44th Evacuation Hospital of the First Army of the United States Forces, helped to liberate several concentration camps in Europe. Mr. Kamen will speak about what his father saw in the town of Gardelegen, Germany. As the Nazi leadership saw that they were no longer winning this war, they continued to carry out Hitler's plan of the final solution. As the Allied forces moved in from the West and the East, the likelihood of their crimes being discovered became evident quickly. Killing centers and concentration camps were evacuated, and the prisoners were taken by foot or by train to destinations deeper inside of German-occupied territory. As the Nazis fled from the advancing Allied forces, they attempted to destroy evidence of the crimes they had committed by destroying the camps themselves. Many of the killing centers, where hundreds of thousands were murdered, were almost completely destroyed. However, the Allied forces were gaining ground too quickly, and not all the evidence was destroyed. The Soviet forces in the East and the US and British forces in the West soon discovered the horrific crimes that Nazis had committed. In the town of Gardelegen, the rail lines, which had proved instrumental to the German war effort and to the final solution, had been damaged in an air raid and could not be used. The SS guards ordered the thousands of prisoners that were to be taken deeper into German territory off the train, enlisted the help of the local home guard and Hitler Youth to help guard the prisoners. When it came time to move the prisoners on what is called a death march, over a thousand of the prisoners were too malnourished and weak to move. In order to avoid the Allied forces discovering these prisoners, many of whom were Allied prisoners of war, the SS guards took these prisoners to a barn, locked them inside, and set the barn on fire. Those who attempted to escape the barn were shot by the guards. The guards had planned to further destroy the evidence the next day, but the arrival of the US Army forced them to flee. Roy Kamen's father, Peter, would be one of those US soldiers who was at Gardelegen. My father was Dr. Peter Kamen and he was born on Galveston Island in Texas in 1915. He subsequently uh, went to medical school to become a doctor, and soon after he graduated medical school, which was also in Galveston, 
he joined the army and became a medical a physician with the army, a captain, and he was part of the 44th Medical Surgeon Hospital in uh, Europe. And he was over there for five years. And um, he married my mom just before going overseas, around 1942. In fact, on December 18th, 1942, because that was also my father's birthday. And this is my father here, Captain Peter Kamen. And this is him standing in front of their mobile surgical hospital, which today is called a MASH unit, made popular in television. But um, they didn't call them MASH units back then, as far as I know. But it was a um, an evacuation hospital on wheels and in tents. And the various places that they would help evacuate prisoners of the Nazis, wherever they had to go, they would go. And uh, one of the places that he went was in Germany. The camp was called Gardelagen, Gardelagen. And I mentioned this one today because he took some photographs while he was in the camp and helping to liberate the prisoners, those who were enslaved. And they were very sick and they were dying. But he witnessed horrors that he believed needed to be told to the world. And he had seen these horrors before in other concentration camps that he helped to liberate. And he believed the world needed to know, but he was afraid the world would not find out about it for several reasons. But one of which was that the Allied forces, those were the military forces who were friends with the United States, they all agreed that while in the concentration camp on the grounds, they were not allowed to take any photographs. It was against regulations. Now photographs were taken by authorized personnel, but he was not authorized to take any photographs. And since this was not the first camp that he helped liberate as a doctor, somehow he was able to get a small camera, a pocket-sized camera in Europe. It was about this tall, the camera, and a, a photograph will be shown on this video. And it was a Minox camera. And uh, the way it worked was it expanded in your hand to reveal the shoot button. And also that allowed you to change the film. And when it was elongated, uh, you could push the button and take the photograph. And after the photograph, you could squeeze it shut and put it back in your pocket. And what he did was, while he was there in the camp and he saw trenches after trenches of dead bodies of prisoners they found who were dead and who had died, um, he reached down by his right pocket. He told me this, uh, we talked about it one time, the only time he ever talked about his World War II experiences. And he reached down into his right pocket, removed the tiny camera, expanded it with his hand, and snapped photos. To move to the next photo, you had to squeeze it shut and then open it again, and that moved the film inside the camera. And he snapped it again when he got to a different location inside the same camp. This was against regulations, so he had to do it in what we would call a clandestine manner so that other people would not see him doing it. That's why he held it to his side. He wasn't sure what would go into the lens. He was just hoping that the material that he wanted went to the film. And fortunately, it did for quite a few photographs. And it was after the war and long after that when he passed away in 1986, my mom and I were going through his effects and his things and we found the camera. And 
I remembered he told me about the camera and why he had it and kept it. He never developed the film, he said. And so my mom and I agreed immediately that we would not try to process the film here in San Antonio because we didn't know how delic delicately or how educatedly the local film processors would handle the camera. So we boxed it up, packed it up, and after a phone call to the newly established National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and with their permission, we mailed it to them. And some curator there took the camera, processed the film, and today you can see eight of the photographs that my father took in the Gardelagan camp. Uh, the way to find them is go to the website for the United States Memorial National Holocaust Museum. And it's one of those .org organizations. And when you get to the main page, you look for the search box in the upper right hand corner and you put in Peter Kamen, K-A-M-I-N, and immediately eight photographs will pop onto the screen and you can see what my father was able to document outside of regulations, but for the legacy of the horror of the concentration camps. I wanted to add that it wasn't the only time my father broke the rules for important reasons. Another example occurred much later in 1950, and we were living as a young family in Galveston, Texas, quite a few years after the war. And it was time for my father to purchase a new office for his medical practice. He was a pediatrician in Galveston, Texas. He found a place that had been already built and used by a different business and he said it was the right size and he bought it. And upon inspection of the building closely, he saw that the front of the building had two doors side by side. There was a walk-up um, patio in the front and then two doors side by side. It looked like a small duplex apartment. The door on the right had a sign on it and it said, colored only. The door on the left had a different sign. It said, whites. This infuriated my father. And he was immediately set into motion to take care of that situation. Unfortunately, still in the 19, early 1950s in Galveston, Texas, there were discriminatory practices all over the place and all over the southern United States. He replaced the small sign that said, colored with a sign that said deliveries and on the other door other door he replaced the sign that said whites with a different sign that said patients and he took some flack locally for doing this other doctors not all other doctors in Galveston but some other doctors resented this thought it was wrong of him to do this and they essentially blackballed him for a short period of time. They refused to refer new patients to my father, being a pediatrician. But time eventually healed that situation and he had a flourishing pediatric practice there in Galveston. In fact, he joined the staff at the medical school there and helped do a lot of teaching there in Galveston, Texas. So my father was a strong man. He was quiet of character. He loved to laugh and joke, and he could be very silly, but he had strong principles that I'm very proud of. And so that's why I was happy to speak to you today about my father, Dr. Peter Kamen. He was aged 27, and he had just recently met my mother, who was a nursing student in New York City. My father was there on an internship as the last part of his medical training. 
met my mother who was in nursing school and they got engaged and got married and then he went off to Europe in the army at age 27. My father's religious practices were strong before he left, um, partially because his mother, who lived there in Galveston, was very active in the Orthodox Jewish community of Galveston. In fact, another thing we're very proud of was she was on the team or the group of Orthodox women who, after a person would die in the congregation, they would be called upon to process the body, to dress it up and get it ready for burial. And that was a religious duty and a privilege, they said, to be able to do that. And that was one of the things that my father grew up with, having occurred many times throughout his childhood. And uh, he had a talus that he received for his bar mitzvah in Galveston, Texas, and he kept that tallis around his shoulders. Not couldn't be very active in some of the other cities because his time was very valuable. Uh, he was either learning new certifications as a pediatrician and in classes or seeing patients. And so uh, he took very good care of us as a family, but he didn't have many um, congregational duties in those other cities. When he finally moved here to San Antonio, I guess that was around uh, 1966, no, earlier than that, 63, uh, he joined Temple Bethel here in San Antonio and was a member of the Brotherhood. And my mother was even more active than he was in the congregation of Temple Bethel here. So religion and religious practices were a very important uh, to him throughout his life. And uh, one other point about that is that um, he didn't speak of his experiences in World War II with the only exception of the camera that he told us about. And um, at that point, we hadn't seen the camera. We only found the camera after he died and we were going through his effects. But he told us about the camera and how he used it in the concentration camps. That's how I knew that he was breaking regulations when he did it. But we didn't see the photographs because they weren't, as I said, they weren't developed until after he was deceased. But um, he was definitely a man of principle. Um, I don't know the real reason, but it was very common that people who served in World War II didn't talk about their experiences. This was very common. In fact, there are some people talking about the Holocaust today, some of the, the survivors who didn't talk about any of that until they were quite elderly already and they saw that society wanted to know. And um, I must admit that in the years after the war while I was growing up, I didn't ask him about it. And um, it just wasn't, wasn't done really in some of our society. He didn't volunteer to talk about it. So we didn't think that it was a restricted area of discussion. It, we just didn't think of asking him, which was our own shortcoming, admittedly. And I'm very sorry we didn't, but we have these photographs to talk about today. Um, I was uh, 14, still very young, and at that point I was a, a, a teenager, and um, as I said, I didn't have the presence of mind to think of asking him more about it. I wish I had. I wasn't, I was not curious. Um, the only exceptions to that didn't cause me to, ca to ask him questions, but he brought a few artifacts back with him from Europe. I don't know how he did it. One item he brought back was a, a walkie-talkie set. 
and it was a kind of a large thing about as big as one's chest and you wore it on your back with front straps and it was in a, a very um, hearty leather squarish carrying case as I said strapped over your back and it had a antenna and it had a talkie thing that you'd put up to your ear with a curly wire that connected it to the pack and my brother and I used to play with that as kids and I'm sure we destroyed it um, I'm sorry that we did but that did happen um, he did bring also a Nazi officer dagger which I still have today and I think the blade on it is eight inches and it's in the original scabbard with a small leatherette uh, attachment that hooks to the belt. Um, my brother and I have kept that, never used it for poking or cutting or anything like that. It, we've kept it um, just for our own legacy. Let's see, we had those two things and uh, he brought a, an officer's Luger pistol also with him and we found that in our toy chest back in the 1950s. Um, it wasn't ever loaded um, in our lifetimes. And I don't know if he took the firing pin out or not, but he didn't, didn't object when we were playing with it. But it was a real Luger, which was a small pistol. That's what a Luger was. Um, we had his military jacket, uh, his military hat. Some of the photographs you will see in this video show him in his military jacket and hat. And um, my brother and I, just in normal play, probably mostly destroyed everything he brought home. He never objected to that. I mean, he was busy loving us as a family and taking care of his patients and his medical practice. So he, uh, at least verbally, didn't look back on the, the items he returned to the United States with or his experiences in the war, which a lot of it was horror. Um, being part of the medical surgical unit. He uh, surprisingly called me into his study or his room once and he said, uh, I'd like to show you something. That's all he said to get me into the room and he showed me the camera. And to me, of course I was 14 and I wasn't playing with toys anymore, but I sure wanted that camera, but I didn't ask for it because he was speaking of it with some reverence. And um, he told me about using it. And as I said before, the restrictions against using it. And uh, he did say that it was important to him at the time to make photographs and share them. He didn't know that that was possible then, but that was his goal. I wish I did, but, but I don't. They're part of, uh, of his army record, which is retrievable. I've tried a few times, but I wasn't successful in retrieving them. But um, he did tell me that he, his team liberated or helped to liberate five camps. Maybe there was more, but that's the number he gave me. Not myself. No, um, personally, I, I really don't want to. Uh, I, I know of the horror, and more than that, I know of the horrible behavior that humans can have, to, as demonstrated by the Nazis. I don't want to learn more about that myself. Um, I, I've been exposed to a lot of that during my life, prejudicial activities and behavior. And I know a lot about the Holocaust and uh, became quite friendly with a few survivors who I still know. They're going fast, you know, they're dying off. But I never had a curiosity to go see it myself. Um, however, I am helpful in, uh, by way of donations to organizations that uh, I really believe in, like the National Holocaust Museum. And this institution here, the Holocaust Museum here and the JCC. But there's a few others too. 
I'm pretty skeptical when I hear about another organization and then one after that and one after that. But that, that's a good question. Uh, I would like to go to Europe, but for strictly happy purposes. That's why I would go. There were a part of my life, almost half of my life, I lived in California. And a few of those years I worked for a, a prominent synagogue in Los Angeles. It was called Stephen Wise Temple. And um, even now, uh, some of the people there at Stephen Wise Temple, uh, they claim to be the largest Jewish congregation in the world, as they were saying. But in those years that I worked there, I'd say it was from 19... 74 until 1978. Uh, I was on staff there as a teacher and a musician. Worked mostly with the teenagers there, and there were many. Um, and there was a lot of uh, Holocaust exposure there, which I took part in. There was many presentations which I provided the music for or played music myself. And by way of that, I learned a lot about the Holocaust that I didn't know before that. And um, I was a teacher in the confirmation class for two of those years, and I provided content to the kids in the confirmation class about the Holocaust. And I learned about it just from periodicals, mostly. And there were a few other um, live people resources, too, uh, that I got to know. Didn't become an expert. I didn't become an expert. I probably wasn't really qualified to be a teacher about it, but I taught them more than they knew, uh, and I felt very good about that. So that was my initial exposure to the Holocaust. That was even uh, that, that was a few years after my father told me about the camera. Um, and then when we, when my mother and I sent the camera to the Holoc the National Holocaust Museum. Uh, their reaction uh, was strong, and they asked for our permission, specifically my mother's, um, to display the photographs and use them in educational ways, which, of course, she signed off on. And uh, I kept up with the museum uh, in, by way of donations, and um, occasional an, an inquiry would come to mind that I, was cur that I wanted to know about, and I would contact curators there or some other resource. And uh, in the years I lived in Los Angeles and worked for the temple there, there were um, several very important uh, Holocaust museum establishments in Los Angeles too. And I would frequent them just as a visitor, not a staff person. Um, but I never became a, a lecturer about it. I don't know enough I think in my own mind to qualify to, to um, be a lecturer or a demonstrator or more than, uh, than I've talked it up when I was younger on the staff of Stephen Wise Temple and after that a little bit. But um, as I said, uh, those photographs uh, make me proud on one hand and on the other hand appreciate my father's character for being in the camps as a physician, administering to those so sick prison, uh, prisoners, and then providing those photographs, which he never knew. He never knew that we gave them to the Holocaust Museum. He would be pleased and proud of that, I'm sure. But I'm very pleased and proud that we did it. No, I, I'd never brought it up. Uh, I never brought up uh, the camera in my discussion with the kids um, because I didn't know if the camera held any photographs. I knew that he, my father broke the uh, regulations to take the photographs, but I didn't think that would be um, an important lesson for the kids because there was nothing to back it up. Now there is. I mean, that's a demonstration of character that I frankly wish I saw more in people. Just one of many positive things that we would benefit from. He, as, as I said, they, he broke rules with his office building and uh, with the, 
the camera, and there were probably other incidences, there had to be, because he was a physician for many, many years, other instances of him going above and beyond what was accepted to do the right thing. Yes, I think it's very important. Um, I, I only hope that it can come across in a way that will motivate a kid to do the right thing in the face of uh, criticism or against regulations when they think that something is really right to step up and do what they think is right. Hopefully it will be. But um, there are not many areas that we can use as examples. Um, of course, there are politicians we can bring up and some historical figures, but the Holocaust was a, a time when people were in horror, and they're still in horror about it when they learn about it. To teach a child who doesn't yet understand what horror is, that's a tall order. That's a very tall order. And even when an elderly person stands up in front of a group of young children who may be barely paying attention, I'm not sure what the value to them is. I respect and applaud the elder persons for doing it. But I don't know if it'll go and make change in these children. I hope it does. Uh, I'm, I'm a real optimist about it, but a skeptical optimist. Um, I want to see it in play. I want to see kids become better people. And so people telling the stories, I think, is a, is a very good thing. And especially the more interesting stories, which I think the story of my father and the camera is a very good story that would grab the attention of kids, maybe for a minute. It's not a long story. It's a short story, but it's colorful. And um, so I'm glad that he did it. And I hope that the children today continue to hear these kinds of stories. And then it triggers them, I hope, to be better people. I can tell you, in addition, that uh, at least here in San Antonio, and one I can think of in Galveston, he saved many children's lives. Um, throughout my life, I kept in touch with a woman who was uh, a Catholic nun in Galveston, Texas. Her name was Sister Nora Dwan. And uh, she was my father's age, but she was a nursing student at St. Mary's Infirmary in Galveston, Texas. And as a nursing student, uh, and all the Catholic nuns there at that place, were learning to be nurses. My father was one of their instructors in pediatrics as part of his life there. I mean, he was a full-time pediatric physician also, but he gave his time to the sisters, uh, the nuns there. And I kept in touch with her all my life. In fact, until right up until her death, which was just last year in Houston, Texas, she was 100 years old. And she told me of one incident uh, in the elevator in Galveston, Texas, around 1951, and elevators were quite primitive back then. Um, but anyway, they were in the elevator. My father, sister Nora, and a young mother and her child got into the elevator. And my dad was speaking with sister Nora because he, he didn't know the mother. But he heard the young child breathing, and he stopped his conversation and said to the mother, your son is very sick. We must get him into the emergency care immediately. That's all that I know of what happened in the elevator, but Sister Nora told me in subsequent years that she followed the progress of that child since she was a nursing student there. And the timeliness and the recognition that my father demonstrated in that elevator saved that child's life because the child was indeed very, very ill. 
And even today, uh, in the house behind the home that my mother lives in, and she's still alive at this point, the house behind us there is an elderly couple who told me just last month that back in the 1960s they had a young boy child who had a serious allergy to some injections which were being given him upon birth by the pediatrician. It wasn't my father. And they learned of my father being a pediatrician and came across the fence and asked my father if he would take a look at this child. And my father did and brought him into his office. And the end of the story was that he discovered that this child indeed did have an allergy. He talked to the present pediatrician of this kid and altered the dosage that the child was getting. It was necessary in, uh, medicine that the child needed. And she t the mother told me last month, your father saved our boy's life. And I've heard that several times throughout my years in San Antonio. So that adds to the list of proud moments with my father. Thank you, Mr. Kamen, for telling us your father's experience during the war and for sharing what an upstander he was throughout his life. Your father's experience reminds me of a quote from General Eisenhower. The things I saw beg your description. I made the visit in order to give firsthand evidence if in the future there develops a tendency to charge that these allegations to mere propaganda. Eisenhower knew there would be great denial. Peter Kamen is a great example of an, what an upstander is. Even though it is not easy to do, speaking up can help make a difference in the world. Being an upstander is just one of the lessons we can learn from the Holocaust. Never again, a phrase you may have heard in reference to the Holocaust, was to represent that another atrocity, such as the murder of six million Jews and millions of others, was to be stopped and never allowed to happen again. But never again has happened again and again. In the words of Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. It is our hope that the lessons you learned this week will inspire you to keep learning, to make your voices heard, to be an upstander, and not to remain indifferent to the suffering of others.